let's move on and if uh, we'll, we'll open it up to questions between sessions and then we'll have a general uh, time permitting we'll have a general q a at the end but uh, tom cannon is uh, extremely familiar with uh, joe jackson's life after uh, the scandal and uh, the aftermath of you know what the state of baseball after these guys were banned and the steps that uh, judge landis took to uh, enforce his new measures with tom cannon Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'd like to thank the Chicago Historical Society for uh, sponsoring this uh, symposium and also to Dr. Dan Flesher for organizing it. Uh, tonight, I really have two major themes. I would like to talk briefly about my grandfather and then secondly, share a few observations about uh, various legal aspects of the uh, Black Sox scandal. Uh, my grandfather, Ray Cannon, was a 31-year-old uh, lawyer in Milwaukee when he got involved in the uh, Black Sox scandal. Uh, he was a, my grandfather graduated from Marquette University Law School. He was probably one of the first celebrity lawyers, um, as that term has evolved uh, throughout the uh, 20th century. Uh, in 1918, uh, he represented Jack Dempsey, uh, who the following year became heavyweight champion of the world. Uh, my grandfather also represented several other world champion boxers uh, in the lightweight and flyweight division and so forth. And he was very active in uh, sports. He was a semi-professional baseball player himself. Uh, he knew Hap Felsch, who was from Milwaukee, and it was Hap Felsch who actually introduced uh, my grandfather to Joe Jackson. Um, in 1922, uh, my grandfather actually started the Major League Baseball Players Union. Uh, the owners, however, got together and crushed it. And so the union itself never got off the ground. Um, about uh, 15 years later, my grandfather was then serving in Congress, and he introduced a bill to end baseball's uh, antitrust, antitrust uh, exemption and have it declared a monopoly. But uh, that effort was quashed when the Attorney General at the time, Homer Cummings, issued a legal opinion saying that uh, Congress could not override the uh, exemption that the uh, U.S. Supreme Court had issued in a 1922 decision. Uh, ironically, as Dan uh, mentioned earlier, my father, uh, Judge Robert Cannon, who was a uh, Milwaukee Circuit Court judge, uh, served as the legal counsel to the Major League Baseball Players Association, not quite a union at the time, from 1959 to 1965. And um, it was actually uh, my father, who was a sitting judge in the 1950s in Milwaukee, who got a call one day from uh, somebody in the clerk of circuit court uh, who told him that the clerk was going through a periodic pruning of old files. And they had come across the 1924 lawsuit uh, filed by Joe Jackson against the Chicago White Sox. They were going to throw it out, and they asked uh, my father if he would like the uh, box of material, and uh, my father said yes, and so uh, fortunately that was saved for uh, history. Um, my grandfather was uh, described in his obituaries as uh, a modern-day Robin Hood, as a champion of the uh, poor, as uh, a lawyer for the underdog. Uh, the New York Times called him the stormy petrel of Wisconsin politics. Uh, he liked nothing better than a good scrap, and um, he liked to take on powerful interests. And two people that he tangled with over a long period of time on behalf of Joe Jackson, but also on behalf of other players and players in general, uh, were Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis and uh, Charles Comiskey. Um, 
The first question that a lot of people might have about this case is uh, some confusion about why are there two trials here? Well, there are two judicial proceedings and they're united by uh, one common piece of evidence. Uh, the, there was a Cook County grand jury that was impaneled to investigate the fixing of the 1919 World Series. Various players from the Chicago White Sox were brought in before the grand jury. They testified under oath, uh, made incriminating statements, and on the basis of those incriminating statements, they were indicted and uh, the case went to trial. Now, you might ask, why would the players walk in there and give statements against their own self-interest? Why didn't they have a lawyer? They did have a lawyer. The lawyer was Alfred Austrian, and he happened to be the corporate legal counsel for the Chicago White Sox. Uh, he did not explain to the players that he was uh, representing the White Sox as the employer's lawyer, not the employee's lawyer. Many of the players were under the impression, all of the players actually were under the impression that he was their lawyer, when in fact he was representing the Comiskey interests and not the players' interests. Um, the chief evidence against the players was these incriminating uh, statements made to the grand jury. However, before the case came to trial in Chicago, the grand jury transcripts were stolen from the state's attorney's office, and several of the witnesses disappeared. So when the case came up for trial, uh, the state's attorney's office was limited to putting on two somewhat peripheral witnesses who couldn't quite put the whole thing together in evidentiary terms. Uh, the state prosecutors tried to introduce the grand jury transcripts, uh, but since the originals were gone, the carbon copies were not signed and the court refused to admit them into evidence. And of course, by this time, the players had their own lawyers and because of the Fifth Amendment uh, right against self-incrimination, they obviously were advised not to testify uh, because now their legal advice was truly in their interest rather than in the corporate interests of the Chicago White Sox. And the result was that it was a very brief trial. The jury was out a very short time and the uh, verdicts were uniformly not guilty. So the key to this whole criminal trial in Chicago was the theft of the grand jury transcripts. A couple of years later, uh, actually about a year and a half later, my grandfather files a lawsuit in Milwaukee County Circuit Court on behalf of Joe Jackson seeking uh, the remainder of his two years of his uh, three-year uh, contract with the Chicago White Sox. And that case came to trial in February of 1924 in Milwaukee. Uh, you may ask, why would a resident of South Carolina, Joe Jackson, sue a defendant corporation in uh, headquartered in Chicago, Illinois, in the Milwaukee County Circuit Court. Uh, normally, that would have that kind of suit would have to have been taken place in Chicago, but the Chicago White Sox were actually incorporated in the state of Wisconsin, and because that was their state of domicile, they were open to being sued in uh, any courtroom in the state of Wisconsin, and so my grandfather filed suit. Uh, in Milwaukee. The, uh, there were essentially two defenses that uh, the White Sox offered uh, to uh, protect themselves from the Jackson lawsuit. The first was uh, the so-called 10-day clause. 
And that essentially made the players what today would be called employees at will, meaning you could be fired on 10 day notice for any reason or no reason at all. We don't have to give you a reason, we just have to give you 10 days notice and you're out. You are an employee at will. And in effect, it, it basically undercuts the whole concept of a contract. Um, the evidence at the trial showed that Jackson actually signed two contracts. He was illiterate. And the first contract, which was signed uh, in the presence of his wife, who was able to read and write, uh, contained no 10-day clause. And uh, Jackson said, I will not sign any contract that contains a 10-day clause. His wife was sitting next to him to ensure that the contract he signed did not contain a 10-day clause. Uh, after the signing, Jackson walked Harry Grabner out the door and out to his uh, automobile. And uh, Grabner then says, oh, by the way, I need you to X out uh, you know, a uh, duplicate uh, original uh, contract for our corporate records. And so Jackson signed uh, another contract, and of course that contract did have the 10-day clause in it. So that whole dispute about the twin contracts uh, was slugged out between the opposing lawyers in the Milwaukee courtroom. Uh, the jury issued a special verdict and found that the contract that Jackson signed, even though it was never produced in court, uh, did not have a 10-day clause, and therefore Jackson was um, not an employee at will, but actually an employee under contract. Therefore, he had the right to sue for breach of that contract for Comiskey's failure to pay him the remaining two years of his three-year contract. The second defense uh, that Comiskey offered, however, was, well, Joe Jackson through the World Series, he's guilty of misconduct, and therefore, even if he was an employee under contract, he's not entitled to be paid because he's guilty of gross misconduct for throwing the World Series. My grandfather says, wait a minute, he was indicted for throwing the World Series. A jury in uh, Cook County, Illinois, tried that issue and returned a verdict of not guilty. So where is there any proof of my client's misconduct? And amazingly, Kaminsky's lawyer pulls out of his briefcase the stolen transcripts from the Chicago grand jury that had been missing for uh, four years and begins to read uh, certain incriminatory statements that Jackson made to the uh, Cook County Grand Jury. Well, of course, my grandfather challenged that and uh, Jackson testified about it and so forth. And the long and the short of it was that the jury believed that Jackson did not throw the World Series, did not commit misconduct, actually issued a special verdict to that effect. And at the end of the case, they returned a verdict uh, awarding Jackson some $16,000 plus, which represented the balance of uh, <clears throat> two years worth of salary that he was owed under the three-year contract that uh, he had signed with the Chicago White Sox. The jury was uh, excused uh, walked out the uh, courtroom door, and the judge uh, then issued a uh, order vacating the verdict of the jury uh, on the grounds of what today would be called judicial estoppel, uh, saying that, uh, Mr. Jackson, your verdict is the product of uh, perjury because you testified in, in front of the grand jury in Chicago that you were part of the 
fixing of the uh, 1919 World Series, and now you come up to Milwaukee and testify that you were not part of fixing the 1919 World Series, and uh, you cannot, uh, as a principle of law, take two contradictory positions in two different lawsuits about the same facts. And so on that basis, he struck the verdict of the jury and um, actually uh, referred the matter to the Milwaukee County District Attorney for criminal prosecution. Uh, the district attorney did not pursue charges, criminal charges against Jackson. Uh, my grandfather appealed the case, the dismissal of the uh, case to the Wisconsin Supreme Court and the matter was settled on appeal. Uh, I've read that the uh, matter was settled out of court, uh, confidential settlement uh, in the amount of $5,000, which would represent slightly less than one third of what the jury actually awarded Jackson. Um, the interesting thing about the uh, surviving material from the Milwaukee trial is the context in which these legal proceedings take place because, uh, as we've just heard, the trial transcripts from the 1921 criminal case in Chicago have disappeared. The grand jury testimony, which was the basis for the Chicago trial, were stolen from the uh, Cook County State's Attorney's Office. And when Bill Beck uh, purchased the Chicago White Sox from the Kaminsky family in 1959, he wrote in his autobiography that the very first thing he did upon purchasing the club was to conduct an exhaustive search of the corporate records for 1919 and 1920 to see uh, if they would shed any light on the Black Sox scandal. And uh, Beck tells in his book that the corporate records were very carefully maintained year by year by year from the very beginning of the Chicago White Sox all the way up to 1959 except for 1919-1920. There was that gap. There were no corporate records. Somehow, somewhere, some way, they disappeared. And so with the absence of the Cook County criminal case records, the absence of the Chicago White Sox corporate records, the Milwaukee trial transcripts are the only surviving evidence of the Black Sox scandal, and there are three aspects of it that I would just like to uh, emphasize tonight for their legal significance. Uh, the first is that the transcripts are the only surviving account of the scandal in the actual words of the principals themselves. And the witnesses in that case included not only Charles Comiskey and Shulis Joe Jackson, but also Harry Grabner, Alfred Austrian, who was Comiskey's lawyer, uh, some of the other players. And so you have basically all of the key participants here, or most of the key participants in their actual words, not the filtered accounts, the secondhand accounts, the abridged accounts, that you read in Chicago and Milwaukee newspapers of the trials. And uh, one of the weaknesses, I think, of Elliot Asinoff's book is that it was based uh, to a large extent on um, newspaper accounts of the trials rather than the actual documents themselves. The second component of the Milwaukee records is the fact that the accounts of the participants uh, were sworn to under oath, and therefore they were subject to the uh, criminal penalties for perjury in the event that somebody didn't tell the truth. And under Wisconsin law, uh, a person who commits perjury is uh, subject to up to five years in prison for each independent lie. So 
they had a witness get up on the witness stand and they told a series of lies or they gave answers that were untruthful to a series of questions, they would face the potential of five years in prison for each false answer to each question. So uh, if you had a witness who was going to commit perjury, they were potentially facing um, a lifetime of uh, exposure to the uh, Wisconsin uh, penal system. The third aspect of the uh, Milwaukee trial records is the fact that this is the only account that is tested uh, by cross-examination from skilled trial lawyers. Uh, and that's important because the, even the testimony before the grand jury, there was no cross-examination. The witnesses came in, they were questioned by the assistant state's attorney, but there's no cross-examination. And because those witnesses weren't actually represented by counsel acting in their own interests, uh, you don't really get the flavor that the whole thing was very trustworthy. And of course, that's why we have this adversarial legal system that we have where you have the government present its story inside of the case, but then that's tested by the cross-examination of defense lawyers. And of course, the defense lawyers can also produce their own witnesses. And out of this clash of direct examination and cross-examination, redirect and recross, plaintiff's witnesses and defense witnesses this is how we decide as a society where the truth lies. And of course that didn't happen in the Chicago criminal trial because of the Fifth Amendment, you couldn't force the defendants to testify. Um, and uh, it's only in the Milwaukee trial that you really get what our society has evolved over many centuries as the best way for discovering the truth of a disputed set of facts. So uh, I think the Milwaukee trial transcripts are very significant uh, because, again, they're the only account of the actual words of the principals themselves. They were sworn to under oath, therefore subject to uh, criminal penalties for perjury, and they're the only statements tested by cross-examination from skilled uh, trial lawyers. The other significant thing I think about the Milwaukee trial, however, is that it does uh, demonstrate criminal uh, behavior, uh, I'm sorry to say, by uh, Charles Comiskey, uh, who may have done many wonderful things as a player, uh, perhaps as an owner, uh, certainly a great figure in the history of the city of Chicago. but. Uh, the grand jury testimony that was stolen from the state attorney's office was stolen by uh, people acting on behalf of Arnold Rothstein, the man who actually fixed the World Series. After their theft uh, and after the acquittal of the players in the criminal trial, those documents were offered for sale to New York newspapers uh, the papers did not bite on them, did not purchase them. But then, three and a half, four years later, they mysteriously appear in the briefcase of Charles Kaminsky's lawyer in this courtroom in Milwaukee. And that actually is a federal crime. Uh, and it is called receipt and possession of stolen property under 18 U.S.C. section 2315. It's a 10 year felony. And uh, there's a kind of a uh, companion crime called misprison of a felony, 18 U.S.C. section four, uh, which requires somebody who has knowledge of the commission of a crime to report it to law enforcement authorities. And the receipt and possession of these stolen grand jury documents by uh, Charles Kaminsky uh, I think demonstrates uh, clear criminal culpability on his part. Uh, he was never prosecuted, he was never indicted, never charged with any uh, criminal misbehavior, but uh, 
speaking strictly as a lawyer, uh, as a former professor of uh, criminal law and legal ethics at uh, Marquette University Law School, uh, this would be as close to an open and shut case as you could get. Um, but he was never indicted or charged. I think that the Comiskey's use of the transcripts to defend himself in the Milwaukee case also demonstrates the double standard that was at work in this entire Black Sox scandal. The players uh, were, of course, banned from baseball and barred from the Hall of Fame. Charles Comiskey was not uh, banned from baseball and was not barred from the Hall of Fame. And it seems to me that if the players uh, were banned and barred, then Comiskey also should have been banned and barred because his behavior in uh, purchasing stolen government records from the people who actually fixed the World Series um, is conduct uh, detrimental to baseball in the same way that the players uh, behaved. And in fact, the argument could be made with respect to Joe Jackson um, that his behavior was actually better than uh, Comiskey's because uh, in his testimony before the grand jury, Jackson actually denied throwing um, the World Series, denied throwing any of the games. Uh, he hit the only home run in the World Series. He had 12 hits, which was a record that stood for about 30 years. Uh, he had no fielding errors and uh, played exemplary uh, baseball throughout the, uh, the series. So um, I think that uh, those are two aspects of the uh, Milwaukee trial that really haven't been focused on by the people who've written about the uh, Black Sox scandal. And um, I would also just like to say very briefly that the uh, surviving source material from the Milwaukee uh, trial consists of uh, a 1,700 page uh, transcript of uh, deposition, pretrial deposition, and trial testimony, uh, together with exhibits from the uh, Milwaukee trial. And uh, there's also extensive contemporaneous uh, newspaper coverage of the trial in the Milwaukee Sentinel, Milwaukee Journal, Wisconsin Daily News. Uh, during the first uh, two weeks of February. Uh, it was also covered well in the Chicago newspapers. And then in addition, um, there was correspondence from my grandfather to Shoeless Joe Jackson. Uh, I think uh, roughly seven or eight letters uh, survived and uh, were discovered some years ago by the uh, Jackson family in uh, South Carolina. Uh, we don't have Jackson's replies to any of this correspondence, so it's just a one-sided uh, correspondence. And um, in closing, I'd just like to say that uh, a number of uh, people have referred to Elliot Asinoff's book, Eat Men Out, and I would actually recommend a book by Donald Grobman, Say It Ain't So Joe, uh, revised edition 1992. I think the first edition came out in 1979, but the revised edition in 1992 is particularly interesting uh, because it contains word-for-word uh, -word, uh, testimony by Jackson in the Milwaukee trial, and it also contains uh, the entire transcript of Jackson's testimony before the Cook County Grand Jury. And you may wonder, where did that come from? Well, in 1989, this venerable body, the Chicago Historical Society, sponsored an exhibit on the Black Sox scandal, which I guess would have been the I don't know, 60th year, 60th anniversary of the 70th anniversary of the uh, scandal. And um, the Chicago law firm of Meyer, 
Thayat and Brown, or is it Meyer Brown and Thayat now? I don't remember. Um, which was the successor of Alfred Austrian's law firm, actually offered the Historical Society a, a copy of uh, Jackson's testimony before the grand jury. And uh, so that was the first time that it had been seen in public anywhere uh, in the world since uh, it appeared and then disappeared again uh, in that Milwaukee courtroom in uh, 1924. But that uh, transcript is produced in full in uh, Grofman's book. It's important that you get the revised edition from 1992 rather than this first edition, 1979. So thank you very much.